The following program may contain coarse language, violence, and mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. We will not be ruled! We will not be ruled! On this edition of The Fifth Estate. It started with a plot to disrupt a gun rally, but that was only the beginning. They conspired to terrorize, kill, and destroy. It ended with two white supremacists in jail. Derail some fucking trains, kill some people, and poison some water supplies. These defendants were hoping for a civil war. In their own words, they craved blood on their hands. USA! USA! One year after America looked militant extremism in the eye and almost flinched, a story of another plot with a Canadian connection. They were dangerous. They studied violence, tested weapons, stockpiled munitions and supplies, and planned to kill in pursuit of their extremist goals. The disturbing ideology that drove it. We realized that they're just going to call us terrorists. And the Manitoba military reservists now facing nine years in a U.S. prison. If you're going to go to jail anyway, might as well do some damage to the system. Welcome, I'm Jillian Findlay. You might remember Master Corporal Patrick Matthews, the Winnipeg reservist outed as a violent neo-Nazi who escaped to the States only to be arrested by the FBI. What you may not know much about is the group that recruited him, stoked his extremism, and according to the FBI, encouraged his violence. It's called The Base, and tonight we're gonna take you inside with exclusive interviews and undercover recordings. A warning, it is a disturbing journey that begins in a Winnipeg park with a young reporter and a career-making scoop. Um, voice memo. I am leaving the meeting with the base. The local base member. I'm gonna try and get up everything I can remember. Pop my head. It's August 2019, and reporter Ryan Thorpe has just had one of the most disturbing interviews of his career. His name is Patrick. He's about 5'10". He's a member of the Canadian Armed Forces. He is some kind of an engineer. <clears throat> he talked about fomenting a race war. He talked about derailing a train. He is Nazi. He is a violent... Um, we spoke for like an hour and a half. There's so much. Yeah, it started with uh, with a news tip, actually. So like many stories do when you're working at a newspaper. Ryan Thorpe writes for the Winnipeg Free Press. The tip was from a reader concerned about a strange new poster popping up downtown. It had the slogan, save your race, join the base. Um, but it did seem to me, you know, looking at it, that this looked like kind of like a white nationalist group of some sort. Um, and that apparently, according to these, these posters, was recruiting in Winnipeg. Um, so yeah, that's all I really knew to, to start with. An internet search revealed the base was indeed a white nationalist group, also a paramilitary group. That got Thorpe's attention and his editors. And I essentially pitched him on two potential approaches for the story. I said, I could contact an academic who studies, you know, far-right groups in Canada. I could contact the Winnipeg Police Service and ask if they're aware of these posters. Um, and then I said, the other thing I could do is they have, like, this email address on the bottom of the poster. And I could just pretend to be someone interested in learning more about their organization and see what happens. What happened was almost immediate. Within 24 hours, Thorpe was communicating with a man he would later learn founded the base and answering all kinds of questions. I was asked questions about my physical fitness level, my race, my sex, um, you know, whether or not I had military training, if I had any experience with firearms, if I had um, a background in chemistry or engineering. I tried to keep as many of the details true to life, and I said that, you know, I'd been born uh, and raised in the prairies and like my family, I had lots of hunters in it and I'd been taught to shoot guns from a young age, which 
was true and I thought maybe that would make me seem like a more attractive recruit, but I didn't want to inflate my credentials. He must have been convincing because the next thing Thorpe knew, he was being told to download an encrypted messaging app and prepare to be vetted. The vetter was the founder, a man who introduced himself as Roman Wolf. He warned Thorpe they weren't looking for keyboard warriors. Becoming a base member meant committing to action. And most of our members are, are pretty hardcore, you know, in that, in that sense. I mean, you're you, you really stepping into, you know, probably the most, like, extreme <laughs> um, group of, you know, pro-white people that you can probably come across, you know, that are close to it. Um, I had been presenting myself as a white nationalist, thinking like, oh, that's like one of the most extreme things people can be, right? Um, and that almost didn't seem like hardcore enough for them. Because uh, I remember Roman Wolf saying like, oh, so you're a white nationalist. Well, most of us are national socialists and or fascists. Like, you need to fascists, he said, committed to building a new world order by working to destroy the existing one. And then towards the end of the conversation, someone else jumped on the line. I'm sorry for being, um, sorry for being late. I, I wish I had a better excuse. So far, it sounds like you're uh, interested, and uh, the person that may or may not have been putting those posters may or may not have been me. Um, so... And it's like, okay, well, this is this is the guy. This is the guy I'm trying to figure out who he is. So that was that was exciting, but um, exciting, but then, even more uh, disturbing. This this voice, this guy, the local guy says, you know, what good are ideals if they're only exercised on paper? And um, again, it was just kind of like a chilling comment to me because it's just like these these are people that aren't just posting online. You know, and they were being very open about if I was going to join this group, they wanted me to engage in paramilitary training with them. But before that could happen, there was one more level of screening, which is how Ryan Thorpe found himself in a Winnipeg park that August night, meeting a man he would soon reveal to the world as Patrick Matthews, nine-year military reservist, combat engineer, committed neo-Nazi. You know, some of the stuff that he said that night just shocked me. You know, he said horrific, uh, horrifically racist, misogynistic, anti-Semitic stuff. Um, so, I mean, I suppose it's kind of what I would have expected given everything I'd been learning about this group and their worldview. But again, it was still, you know, pretty disturbing to be face to face with someone who thinks they've met a comrade in arms and they're just spewing this this hatred. As Thorpe would soon learn, hatred was the worldview, along with destruction and violence. At one point, we were walking, and there was this rail line, and he was pointed it out. And he was like, well, that offers an opportunity, you know? These are the train tracks here that Matthews kind of openly discussed the possibility of sabotaging. All you would have to do is kind of yank up one side of the the rail line, and, and he, he had said something like, you, you wouldn't even need to make that go boom, which I took to mean like, you wouldn't even need to plant a bomb, all you would have to do is sabotage the rail track and you could do a lot of kind of destruction. To prove they'd actually met, Matthews needed a picture with Thorpe. He told him the base was built on cells. He'd been to the States to train with other cells. Now he wanted to establish one in Winnipeg to share his skills and prepare for what he predicted was imminent social collapse. He asked if I had a gun license, and I said no. He said, well, you should get one. And in the meantime, he offered to supply me with guns. And, you know, and he was essentially talking about trying to disseminate his knowledge and skill set that he had gained in the military onto me. Um, he was going to supply you with guns, he said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. He talked about doing firearm training. He suggested I get a gun license. He's a man. He's not dumb. He's f***ing dumb. As Thorpe ran from the park that night, he knew he had a story and an obligation to tell it. This was an individual who had been trained by the Canadian government 
in military tactics, in firearms, in explosives, who was a, I had confirmed was a member in this like ultra violent hate group. And then when I met him in person was talking about the possibility of perpetrating violence. Like, no, I mean, I think you have to, you have to print that story. 16 hours after the free press published, the RCMP was at Matthew's door. Police would later say they seized multiple weapons that night, but for all the concern Matthew's story raised, he didn't stay in custody long. The next day, he was back at home in the tiny town of Beausager. You're Patrick Matthew? Uh, somebody. And nine days later, he was gone. His red truck found abandoned near the U.S. border. When we come back. And you f like put a bunch of explosives, thermite, whatever the f you can. They wanted to bring down the United States government. They wanted to see a civil war in the United States, and they wanted to kill federal officials. That was their intention. In the dark and disturbing world of militant hate, secrecy is paramount. The base thought its vetting process was rigorous, its communications on encrypted apps and chat rooms impermeable. Membership is limited to nationalists of European descent. But two years ago, a man claiming to be one of the group's first members walked away from the base, taking with him thousands of screen grabs, videos, and audio recordings. Do you feel you're in danger? Not right now, because I'm anonymous. But if you weren't? If I weren't, there'd be people who would probably want to shoot at me, because I'm the enemy. Tradian is the man who made the recordings. In real life, he's an anti-fascist activist. He shared his material selectively with other journalists and researchers, but he's never spoken publicly until now. So what is the base? It is a Nazi group, and there's no question about that to me. Every single person who joined was a Nazi of some form or another. But not just your regular Nazis, in love with the symbols and ideas of a white ethno-state. Base members believe they can build that state by expediting the collapse of the existing one. I feel that the only way how things are going to get better is if a collapse happens and a new dawn arises. It's called accelerationism, and the recordings are filled with discussion of how to make it happen that and fears that white people like them are in danger of being replaced. Africans and Arabs mate with our women and drive us into extinction. Well, race mixing is disgusting. And it gets even worse. Some of them advocated something called universal order, in which you kill literally everybody that's not white. Kill everybody who's not white? Everyone, everyone. That's universal order. Well, this is a group that believed that the country was heading toward an inevitable civil collapse, um, that there would be some kind of mass disorder, and they wanted to be prepared not only to commit acts of violence, to hasten the collapse of civil society, but also after that collapse happens, to be in a position to then militarily take control. Um, and in some ways, you know, this is a bit delusional. It's a very small group of people. Um, but they believed that eventually more people would be brought into their circle um, and would join their side in the fight. Researcher Cassie Miller was one of the first to listen to the base tapes and to analyze those being vetted for membership. Um, the reason why I wanted to join the base is I want to fight for my future and for the future of my future children. You know, there was nothing about them that made them predestined to become a member of a neo-Nazi group. Um, these were young men who had come to believe that the problems they faced could be blamed on people of color, um, on Jews, on women, and that the only way to deal with it was through violence. I'm from Alabama. Grew up in Belfast. I came from the Ukraine. Arizona. 
Earth Night Nationalists from Perth, Western Australia. The recruits were from all over the world, more than a hundred of them, male, white, and the majority young. Well, I'm 17 right now. I'm, I'm currently in high school. Almost invariably, they've been radicalized on other extremist sites. Their journey down the rabbit hole of hate eventually leading them to this man. Why did I create the base? To some, he was known as Roman Wolf. To others, Norman Spear. In real life, he is Ronaldo Nazaro, an American now living in Russia, a former U.S. defense contractor who assures his followers the U.S. collapse is coming. My assessment is that uh, if things continue, if the pressure on the white population in the United States continues to intensify, uh, there will be regional resistance movements. And it's that resistance he wants to exploit. On the tapes, Nazaro assures recruits nothing they'll be asked to do is against the law. But a look at Nazaro's early Twitter feed reveals the ruse, a promise to finish what Hitler started, illustrated instructions on how to stage a sniper attack. The mask occasionally slips in the chat rooms, too. To a member pushing to make the group's recruiting materials more explicit, he says, we need a public face that's as innocuous as possible, but still attracts the right people. Nazaro knew that there was no collapse. He knew that there was, that that's impossible. He said that to me himself. That was never the plan. The plan was to cause the collapse, to become the crisis. All right, we're rolling. Everyone set? One, two, three, go! So that, he says, is what those training camps are really about, preparing for guerrilla war. As far as survivalism and self-defense, to what is your experience level? You said you're proficient with firearms. Every recruit is asked about weapons, what they have, and what they can get. Once I'm 18, I'm going to try to get a gun. There's a lot of different places you can go for, like, sniper training. I'm pretty proficient with firearms, looking to become a combat engineer. I'm currently in the military, um, but I'm in the National Guard. Those with actual military experience are particularly prized, including Canadian combat engineer. Patrick Matthews. People like Matthews, perfect for this gig. Specifically his knowledge of explosives. That was considered valuable. So that's why he was given the role of trainer. And he was going to just train people while he was here. So back to Patrick Matthews. Within days of being outed by the Winnipeg Free Press, the military reservist disappeared. The man accused of recruiting for a global neo-Nazi terrorist group goes missing. Corporal Patrick Matthews had been relieved of his duties. RCMP are investigating him for allegedly recruiting for a far-right hate group called The Base. Months after his truck was found abandoned at the U.S. border, no one seemed to know where he was. Not even ace reporter Ryan Thorpe. For the longest time, it's like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure he fled the country and um, hooked up with members of the base in the United States and is up to, you know, who knows what down there, but I don't, I don't really know what's going on, yeah. But unbeknownst to Thorpe and unbeknownst to Matthews, someone did know what was going on, the FBI. In late August 2019, it tracked two other base members, William Bilborough and Brian Lemley, as they drove north towards the Canadian border. So we were aware of um, Brian Lemley and William Bilborough being members of the base in the state of Maryland, and they became aware that Patrick Matthews had crossed illegally into the United States, and they drove from Maryland to southwest Michigan, a distance about 600 miles, uh, to pick up Patrick Matthews and to bring him back to the East Coast to harbor him. The FBI won't say what twigged them to the two base members, but by October, agents had tracked them to this farm in the state of Georgia, where they even had an undercover agent in place as base members arrived from one of those training camps. The agent watched as Matthews instructed in tactical maneuvers and helped burn an American flag. 
According to the FBI, the group talked about eliminating their enemies, a plot to kill two anti-fascist activists, and reporter Ryan Thorpe seemed high on their hit list as well. There was one death that week, a neighboring farmer's ram sacrificed in a bizarre ritual. The pictures, like everything else, uploaded as propaganda. Like, those guys were on a trajectory that was going to be violent, and it was. There was no question about it. I could hear them tick. What, what, what were you worried about? I was worried that they were going to engage in spree killing. Okay. And they'd still make the playoffs. And he wasn't the only one. When Matthews and Lemley left Georgia for Delaware and took up residence in this apartment, the FBI was all over them. Secret court orders allowed for searches and bugging. Surveillance was 24 hours a day. Uh, we collected thousands of hours of tape, of audio tape, video recordings, um, thousands of hours. Um, every time that one of the defendants in the apartment were watching and listening, and uh, we were collecting evidence as they talked about what their intentions were and what their plans were. We killed the fucking government, which is the fucking enemy. As the FBI listened in, the plans and the targets shifted. One day, it was Antifa members. Stop letting them breathe. Make them fucking disappear. And you don't need to kill them all. By God, we don't have the bullets. The next, any black person, including children. Yeah. I don't care if I've shot a bunch of black kids and something in the back of my head is ringing and it feels bad. I don't care. I'm not going to say it. I'm not gonna I'll do it. it. But mostly, they talked about ways to cause that collapse. Here's Matthews attempting to disguise himself with a gas mask. If you want the white race to survive, you're going to have to do your part. Derail some trains, kill some people, and poison some water supplies. You better be ready to do those things. If not, then you're not going to be ready for what's coming. As assistant, it's very shocking. It's shocking to listen to him um, talk about discussing killing African-American children, uh, to listening to the words of Adolf Hitler, uh, to discuss wanting to bring down the United States government, uh, where he's not even a citizen of the country, and wanting to contribute to violence in this country. It's, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. It should shock everyone. And even more shocking was the equipment the two were accumulating. A sniper rifle, a homemade assault rifle Matthews assembled from parts, night scopes, infrared sensors, ammunition rounds by the thousands, and crates of dehydrated food for life on the run. For weeks, the FBI followed them to gun stores and shooting ranges as their plans started to crystallize around an upcoming gun rally in nearby Virginia. The prospect for violence was high, and if it did break out, Matthews and Lemley wanted to be there to accelerate what they truly believed would be a civil war. I mean, if this thing goes off, and let's say they start fighting in Virginia. We shoot at the government. We kill the cops. We blast the net guard. What we do, we can't really live with ourselves if we don't get some like blood on our hands. How bad would you feel if there was a battle in Richmond and you weren't even there? Wouldn't you feel like a piece of shit? We realize like they're just going to call us terrorists. They're going to go to jail anyway. Might as well do some damage to the system. USA! The Virginia rally was January 20th, and despite massive amounts of weaponry, it went off without anyone firing a shot. Matthews and Lemley never even made it. Four days earlier, the FBI raided the Delaware apartment and arrested them. An update on the case of one of the men arrested and linked to a violent white supremacist group transporting and harboring Patrick Matthews. He was arrested along with two other alleged members of an aggressive neo-Nazi group called the base. The news made headlines on both sides of the border, but in Canada, it also raised serious questions. How long had Canada's military known a violent neo-Nazi was in its ranks? And why did the RCMP let him go? When we come back. It would certainly cause an additional investigation in the United States. It should have caused additional investigation. It would cause an additional investigation in the United States. Beautiful and pure to victory, white man! 
Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath turned into a scene of horror. A gunman had entered the mosque. He would kill 41 people before he left. Every cult, no matter how twisted, has its pantheon. Prayers were just wrapping up when someone burst in and opened fire. In the base, no one was revered more than gunmen who massacred. What happened here last night is being called an act of mass murder by the mayor of this city. Times like these are what birth heroes. They referred to folks like Timothy McVeigh, who did the Oklahoma City bombing, or um, Brenton Tarrant, who did the shooting in New Zealand. They called them the saints. They would post these like hyper stylized portraits. If you could think of like the Obama Hope, the famous kind of blue and, and red photo, it would be like stuff like that. The moment when I got really worried was El Paso and Christchurch. And I remember all the memes and all the hero worship of those shooters that came after that. Did you ever hear or see things that made you think that any of those members were considering the same kind of action? Everyone was looking for, you know, trying to work up the courage to do it. And that, he says, included base member and former Canadian reservist Patrick Matthews. Uh, people like Matthews, I was worried about guys like him. Uh, that guy, uh, he almost made it his business to have as little to lose as possible. When the RCMP detained Matthews following his outing by the Winnipeg Free Press, it knew he was an accelerationist who believed in violence. It told the public it searched produce multiple weapons. But what police have never said publicly is that it also found this, a handwritten list in Matthews' wastebasket, later filed in court by the FBI. Locations and dates of mass killings, a tally of dead and wounded, details about the shooters responsible, a veneration or a guide. I think a lot of these extremists look to like-minded people who have taken acts of violence and they hold them up to be a martyr-like figure and some of them want to emulate them when they're planning their own acts of violence. Mm -hmm. I think it should be a warning to all of us. But was it a warning to the RCMP? If you had, in an investigation, come across that, knowing what somebody's ideology was, knowing they had weapons, and had come across a list like that, would that have set off alarm bells? Well, obviously it sets off alarm bells. It would certainly cause an additional investigation in the United States. It should have caused additional investigation. It would cause an additional investigation in the United States. Do you know whether it did in Canada? I do not know. The RCMP refused our request for an interview. In a statement, it admitted there was no additional investigation after it found that list. There was limited opportunity, it said, given Matthew's decision to flee nine days later. But the RCMP statement also reveals something else. Matthew's list of mass killers was actually first discovered two months earlier by Canadian border officials searching his truck as he returned from a trip to the States. So what was done then? The RCMP won't tell us, and nor will Canada's military, whose comments about their former reservist have been contradictory from the start. He is a Class A soldier, and he last worked in May. And at that point, we weren't aware that uh, there were any issues. That's Matthew's commanding officer the day after the Winnipeg Free Press story, a position echoed by the man who now heads Canada's military. So I have to thank the reporter who did uh, bring that to our attention uh, for, for bringing that information forward. But two days after those statements, the military story changed. On the current situation with regard to Masco Matthews, I want you to know that this was a signal we did not miss. The Canadian Forces National Counterintelligence Unit uh, had already begun to deal with him by the time that story broke. According to the country's then top soldier, Matthews had been on their radar for months. He went under, underwent his first contact with the chain of command in April. Uh, so we didn't miss a signal. I'm happy to say we didn't miss a signal. So what was that April contact? And what happened as a result? The military also refused to be interviewed, and once again, there are contradictions. Heavily redacted documents obtained by the CBC show military counterintelligence opened a file on Matthews, not in April, but on June 6th, 
closed it the following day. A month later, a second file was opened and once again closed. And from what I read in the ATI, the Access to Information Request, there doesn't seem to have been any follow-up at all, except it's a bleep on the radar, it disappeared, case over. We asked Michel Drapeau, lawyer and former longtime military member himself, to review the documents we got. Because of his training, because of his experience, and because of his rank, he had access to explosive, certainly knowledge of, of such, and, and weaponries and the like. And, uh, you know, and, and it should be a warning that we need to, at the very least, to make a few calls and to send somebody maybe to speak and eyeball to eyeball to determine if there is anything substantial or anything of concern. I mean, they just turned the page. That's what comes across. Until others started investigating and it all became public. Their concern became all of a sudden elevated uh, when the news report came out and more insignificantly when the U.S. authority got, got involved. If it hadn't been for the media report, we would have had no warning, although, in fact, he had been identified along the way as a potential source of, 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 of concern. Whatever military counterintelligence knew about Matthews that summer, it wasn't shared with his Winnipeg commander who in the early days went to great lengths to assure Canadians the nine-year military veteran was not a danger. He has no access to weapons. He has some very rudimentary training on explosives, as any combat engineer would. So he basically has a basic understanding of demolitions, and he has only access to these types of things on sanctioned military exercises. It makes me upset when I hear that. I mean, he's not a 15-year-old kid with a laptop. He's somebody, in fact, who, who has the physical, the mental, and the experience and the skills associated with it, that if he wanted to use explosive and to obtain them and to achieve a given objective, he certainly would be as well-trained as you would want anybody to be in this kind of mission, in this kind of objectives. And then there's the issue of how Matthews came to leave the armed forces. In late August, days after the Free Press story, the military announced it had fired him for cause. But today, it says it actually relieved him of his duties in early August, before he was exposed. And once again, for reasons it won't explain, failed to tell his local command. When we find out that, uh, that members hold these views or are acting in ways contrary or, or not aligned uh, with our own values, we act. If the military sounds defensive, it's because Matthews is not the first member to be exposed for extremist beliefs. A CBC News investigation recently revealed Canadian Rangers with links to two far-right groups. A lone male drove through the gate of Rideau Hall, and D&D has confirmed he's an active member of the Canadian Armed Forces. The group is known for its anti-immigrant, anti-Islam views. Its founders include former military members. I think the military generally bends to the right. Um, I've, I've encountered you know, plenty of casual racism and misogyny. There's probably, you know, a lot worse. Two years ago, Calgary-based reserve sailor Boris Mihalovich was exposed by the CBC as the administrator of a notorious and secret neo-Nazi forum. Among his posts, talk of buying illegal weapons and using his military training to be more effective in the race war. Well, like I said, I was suspended for uh, about seven months. At the time, Mihalovich told his commanders his beliefs had changed, which seemed good enough for the military, at least initially. During that time, I had to kind of do some extra training. I had to meet with uh, an officer in my unit. Um, I believe it was once a month. And at the end of that, I was reinstated. <laughs> and then two weeks later, I was suspended again. What happened? Media backlash, public backlash from me being reinstated um, caused them to revert their position, basically. So they did it for optics? Is the, yeah. This was a public, had become a public relations problem exactly. for them. Which is what makes it so difficult to distinguish military truth from military spin. 
All right, the date is September 19th, 2019. It's 10.50 p.m. We're interviewing Dakov from Ottawa, Canada. Among the more than 100 hours of those base vetting tapes, there is another Canadian voice claiming a military link. I got into fascism uh, back when I was like 14, 15. Dakov, who now claims to be 19, tells them he's newly enlisted and waiting for basic training. What really grabs their attention is his plan to continue his training in artillery and battlefield tactics. So, okay, you're going to JTAC school. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, well, JTAC, CBRN, and Airborne. Uh huh. Wow. Nice. That's that's pretty awesome. Awesome too, apparently, is Dakov's yeah, promise awesome to recruit awesome. others. Oh, I found a few guys that I talked to who were willing to join. One guy named Tech. He lives like two hour drive away from me. There's one other guy. He has a Ruger Mini, and he says he's a. Um, getting his restricted PAL license so he can uh, purchase ARs. You were part of the vetting call for Dakov? Yeah, yeah, I was part of Dakov's vetting call. So tell me about what you remember. All right, so Dakov is a person who is in a leadership role within what I call the skull mask community. He's the ideal, you know, recruit. He's social, you know, well-connected, so he knows other guys, right? He's going to get military training, so he's going to have lots of know-how to train other people. So was Dakov for real? The military assures us the person calling himself that has never been an Armed Forces member. But how did it investigate? And given the name was a pseudonym, an online handle, how would it even know? When we come back. Let me be clear. Lemley and Matthews betrayed their countries and forfeited their freedom. Today's sentence ensures they will never achieve these goals. These defendants were hoping for a civil war. In their own words, they craved blood on their hands. It all came to an end last October at a federal courthouse in Greenbelt, Maryland. Patrick Matthews pleaded guilty to the charges against him. Along with Brian Lemley, he was sentenced to nine years in a federal prison. Let me be clear. Lemley and Matthews betrayed their countries and forfeited their freedom. When they conspired with others to attack, to attack and murder innocent civilians, children, police officers, and federal agents. Today's sentence ensures they will never achieve these goals. Before he was sentenced, Matthews was given a chance to speak. I got involved with the wrong people, he told the judge. What else is there to say? His parents didn't have a lot to say either. His father told the court his son was too kind to hurt anyone. As for his mother... No one, no one wants to be in this position as a mother, but I know I am a changed person for it. I have so much compassion for anybody that gets into trouble. You know, and he certainly got in trouble. He, 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 Nazaro, where the fuck are you? Nazaro, the base leader who recruited Matthews and encouraged him to recruit others, was on social media that day, hailing Matthews and Lemley as heroes. And because of the length of the sentence, political prisoners. Uh, most likely but these days, Nazaro's influence is waning. The base, as an organization, is all but defunct outlawed in Canada, the UK, and Australia as a terrorist entity. In the U.S., thanks to the FBI, six base members are now in prison, including members of that Georgia cell convicted of conspiracy to murder. Frankly, as a brand, the name is ruined. Um, no one wants to be associated with a group that, you know, experienced this number of arrests and was infiltrated so many times. But does that mean the threat has, has gone away then? I no, the threat has not gone away. The people who are member of the members of the base are those who are especially militant and most deeply committed to a violent white power ideology. And those people don't just disappear once the group disappears. We know the truth. We will continue to organize for ourselves White nationalism 3.0 style. They've worked tirelessly for the destruction of European homogeneity. 
Indeed, in the ecosphere of hate, accelerationists and their beliefs are more prevalent than ever. Names may change, but ideas don't. Look at this. Another neo-Nazi group also committed to so-called racial purity and action. Now recruiting all over North America, including Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Ontario. You know, back two years ago now, when I was started to look into this in Winnipeg, um, I was genuinely concerned that this story would end up with someone seriously hurt, killed. Um, that was always a, a serious possibility in my mind. Yeah. And do you feel any less strongly about that today? No. If, no, if anything, I think the facts that have now come to light kind of vindicates my, my concern at the very beginning of this, this story. So this is the base flag. This is a triple AWAS. Let's see. It's meant to be like a neo-Nazi 3%er logo. Nazaro gave it to me in New York City. As for the man known as Tradian, who perhaps knew the base better than anyone, an even starker warning. Is the base gone? No. Is it dead? No, it's not. There's still a lot of people out there who subscribe to this ideology. And they're getting more bold, more open. There's a lot of them. And all they have to do is wink at each other with just the right words, just the right images, and then link up and do some damage. And just in case you think that's hyperbole, that accelerationist ideas are twisted fantasies destined to fail in the real world, consider this. What really needs to happen right now is about 200,000 true patriots need to march up into, f into the Capitol building and put a bullet everybody's head in the mother. F that's the voice of a would-be base member on one of those vetting calls, advocating for an attack on Congress a full year and a half before this. Just kill everybody in it and then turn around and say, look, we're done. This is what's going to happen from this point on. If you have a story you think needs to be told, send us your tips to fifthtips at cbc.ca. For a more confidential way to contact us, visit our website at cbc.ca slash fifth and click on Secure Drop.